afternoon. My name is yes. Ray Tsuchiyama with Think Tech Asia, and we'll be delving into e-commerce in Asia, particularly in China and Japan. We have Russell Liu, our co-host, in the Beijing in a very rainy period during spring, June of this year, and he's going to be really expressing uh, insights and more analysis of e-commerce and particularly mobile commerce in the People's Republic of China, which has a population now of over 1.3 billion citizens, as opposed to China, Japan, which is kind of stalled at about 129 million citizens. So is Russell on? Uh, Russell Liu from Hadian District. Hello, Ray. All the fellow Hawaiians and everybody back in the U.S. Uh, welcome to uh, Think Tech. We're live in uh, Beijing with our co-host in uh, Ray, who's in the beautiful Honolulu, sunny Honolulu. It's raining here in Beijing, uh, but overall, it's a very nice day here. Um, and I, I like to kind of uh, uh, tell you the biggest trend right now, or the biggest evolution in commerce, really, is what we call e-commerce, e-commerce, right. and um, it, it's it's a it's a very big phenomenon now here in China. Well, not really a phenomenon, Ray. It's something that's taken off, and it's going to be here to stay. Um, with smartphones, uh, people are doing things online. Uh, they're buying things uh, over the internet. Um, they're using their smartphones to buy everyday groceries, going to the store, buying a soda. Nobody cares cash yet. Everybody is into e-commerce. And so we're going to explore that topic today. When you first arrived in uh, Beijing, uh, Russell, um, a dozen, 15 years ago, how did people in, in Beijing buy, buy things? Did they go to malls, to small stores? Uh, how did people buy, what, you know, things to kind of like CDs or uh, clothing or food? Well, Ray, that's a really good question because, you know, when I first got to Beijing nearly 14 years ago, um, I lived on the suburbs right next to the farming country. I was at a university um, and people carried cash. Everywhere you went, you carried cash. And sometimes, if you were going to buy an electronic, something more expensive, you'd have thick wads of cash. It reminds you of the Japanese uh, visitors in, 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 in Honolulu about 30 years ago, carrying thick wads of cash, saving up to buy this particular item. But today, it's changed. It's, it's totally a revolution because nobody carries cash. Your bank account is tied to various e-commerce platforms. And you could be in your office, nobody knows it, but you've just bought something. And, and, and you will buy it and the transaction will take a few seconds. And it, and it, will, it, will, take, it will be take a debit against your bank account. It's tied into your bank account. So the merchant is happy and um, the sale is made. So, so uh, what I'm hearing from you, Russell, that in barely 15 years, you saw a transition from cash-driven economy to mobile online uh, e-commerce without credit cards that so dominated the United States and Japan for decades. It, Ray, that's a really good observation because what's happened is that um, I think these are new global platforms. And the U.S. is, is really behind here. Um, there's le new legislation uh, coming soon. Um, and it's incredible the amount of uh, e-commerce sales that happens here in China. For example, in 2017, e uh, mobile e-commerce sales was U.S. $630 billion. Now, you think about that. That sounds big, but you compare that with the U.S. And the U.S. mobile e-commerce sales was $96 billion. So we're seeing uh, a seven, eight times uh, amount greater e-commerce sales in China. Um, and what we're seeing is that of the total resales and total retail sales in China, it's about 13.5% and growing. 
In the U.S., uh, e-commerce mobile sales accounts for 1.9% of total retail sales. So what does that mean? That means that we have a platform in the U.S. where retailers uh, are still in the uh, brick and mortar stage. Expensive malls, um, expensive retail costs, um, operating costs. In China, you don't have that. You have the e-commerce vendors uh, who, will, who will get the different vendors. And there's no mortar brick. So the sales, uh, can the price can be a lot less, much more affordable to consumers. Um, yeah. In Japan, there are sites like Rakuten, which is very big uh, e-commerce, mobile commerce center. There's Amazon Japan, Apple, Yahoo Japan Shopping. In the U.S., of course, Amazon, eBay, many, many, um, uh, the Land's End and Sears uh, dominate the, the, the e-commerce landscape. What is the biggest uh, e-commerce site in China right now? Yes, and, and, and like Japan, um, we're seeing the phenomenon all over Asia, particularly Japan, uh, China, and Korea. Um, you know, the question is, why should we care in the United States about e-commerce in Asia, particularly China and Japan? Well, let's look at it. 2016, retail sales across the globe will reach $22 trillion, okay? By 2020, it's expected this will reach to $27 trillion. So this is a new global platform. We're going to be doing business by e-commerce. And we're seeing that in the U.S. through Amazon.com and so forth. Um, but again, uh, it's interesting because I understand Apple, the new Apple phone will uh, design so that platform uh, can be used in Asia for e-commerce using WeChat Pay, Alipay, and so forth. Um, so that's very interesting. But why is China important? Because the bulk of retail sales, commerce, e-commerce comes from China, where it's expected that this year it's going to reach $900 billion in e-commerce sales in China alone, almost 40%, 7% of the total worldwide e-commerce sales. And that's a big number. That's something that uh, it's impressive. Now, in Japan, when I mentioned Dakuten, it's a local Japanese site. Amazon, Japan is from the U.S., Amazon. In Japan, what's interesting is that one out of four uh, buys or purchases are in electronics, but also there's a very big fashion fashion industry going on led by a site called Zozo Town. And it's very big, uh, and a lot of young people, young women, young men buy uh, fashion uh, through Zozo Town. And there's other areas like, you know, toys, games, you know, small things and so forth, not huge, uh, you know, uh, I guess, uh, furniture and so forth. And, of course, books and, and CDs. What are the areas that Chinese consumers buy uh, in categories? Uh, is it also fashion, uh, CDs, electronics, uh, food? Uh, what, what is the categories in China? Yes, the, the big category, about 47% of all e-commerce sales uh, are electronics. I'll give an example. Um, this is how I think as a Westerner, and I really, I caught myself because I lost my Samsung TV controller. I somehow lost it in my apartment. Um, and first thing as a Western, as an American, I kept thinking, where's my booklet? I've got to find the address and the phone number for the service, for the service facility. That's how we do it in America. We go back to the service facility. And I couldn't find it. So I went to my secretary and asked her, how can I get this? And she said, easy. We're going to go to the e-commerce vendor, JD.com. Mm -hmm. And she pulled up the website and she found my uh, controller, third-party vendor, it cost me 30 quai, 30 renminbi, which is about $4. And she punched the order in, I got it two days later. And that's how quick it is. So there's a lot of efficiency and logistics here. Uh, the electronic industry is a big one. But I see another area that's coming up very quickly. It's lifestyle. People are buying a lot of lifestyle things. And it's no wonder why uh, the Japanese retailers, Uniqlo, uh, Muji, is very big in China. Very big. And I'm, I'm pretty soon we'll see them, I'm sure, on the online e-commerce sales. That's very big. And so that's what I'm getting into. Why is China important? Because China is a retail destination for e-commerce. 
e-commerce, whether it's uh, vendors inside China or outside China, cross-border transactions. But let me give you a little history of how this really boomed. In 2009, the Alibaba Group, which is one of the largest e-commerce platforms, created a day called the Singles Day. On November 11th, every year, it's equivalent of a Black Friday. And so just in that one day, on November 11th in 2016, they netted in $17.8 billion, U.S. dollars. Online e-commerce sales, one day, largest e-commerce sales in a single day in, in, in anywhere. Now let's compare, um, this was four times greater than the 2016 black sales, uh, I guess they call it Black Friday sales in the U.S. So you can tell that there's tremendous opportunity here if you're tied into e-commerce, even if you cross border in the U.S. No, uh, Black Friday, it, right after Thanksgiving, is still huge in the U.S. And that's when people go to malls, you know, they fight over uh, all kinds of electronics or toys and so forth. Also, people go online now, and there's been a huge boom, even in the U.S., uh, online shopping. There's also been simultaneously a decline in what you referred to as the brick and mortar malls. There's been a lot of malls going out of business in the United States. It's really hard to uh, conduct business when people are going through their uh, laptops or mobile phones to buy uh, products and get them shipped to them. Now, is that a trend in China? Did the malls uh, come up? and then disappear, or they never got built, or there's still some shopping in uh, Nam Fu Jin Lu or Wang Fu Jin Lu or, you know, all these uh, big shopping places in major urban centers. Are they still um, uh, doing well? Well, the malls are still doing very well, extremely well. Um, and two functions of the mall, first of all, more of the lifestyle stores uh, are appearing in the malls, whether it's coffee for Starbucks or Muji, the lifestyle store, whether it's Bose Entertainment uh, or um, Haagen-Dazs ice cream, it's a lifestyle uh, type of thing. Second of all, it also could be a market loss leader because when people get a chance to see the products, try it, you know what they're going to do? They're going to jump back on e-commerce because they've seen it and they know the quality and that's very important. But again, tying back um, to the U.S. e-commerce, so I think that Americans have to start to think global. For example, Black Friday in, in November 2016, Alibaba created um, to connect the Chinese consumer with American inst retail institutions. Macy's went live online using a virtual uh, reality tool. So people in e-commerce could see Macy's like they're buying things. Um, we also saw... And we're gonna we're gonna hold that thought, and we're gonna return in just a minute. Aloha, my name is Stephen Philip Katz. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, and I'm the host of Shrink Wrap Hawaii, where I talk to other shrinks. Did you ever want to get your head shrunk? Well, this is the best place to come to pick one. I've been doing this. We must have 60 shows with a whole bunch of shrinks that you can look at. I'm here on Tuesdays at 3 o'clock every other Tuesday. I hope you are too. Aloha. We all play a role in keeping our community safe. Every day, we move in and out of each other's busy lives. It's easy to take for granted all the little moments that make up our every day. Some are good, others not so much. But that's life. It's when something doesn't seem quite right that it's time to pay attention. Because only you know what's not supposed to be in your every day. So protect your every day. If you see something suspicious, say something to local authorities. We are back on Think Tech Asia with Russell Liu all the way in Beijing. We're talking about e-commerce, the great wave that's going all over the globe to make shopping easy electronically through the laptop, through um, the PC, or through the mobile phone, what we call M-commerce or mobile commerce, and that's going to be really driving sales in the future. We're talking about the People's Republic of China, we're talking about Japan, we also will be 
thinking about in the future new economies coming up, new emerging economies like India, South America, and Africa. And it's quite possible we're going to skip, like China, a whole generation of credit cards and go directly into electronic um, buying, purchasing in the future. So this is a harbinger of emerging uh, markets and economies, one that was driven by uh, Japan, the United States, and Western Europe, and now by China that's leaping into this uh, whole space without going through an evolution of credit cards and malls that are uh, peripherated throughout Western Europe and North America. We're going to return to Russell, how he's seeing the uh, compare contrast between the Chinese boom and acceptance of very easy purchasing through e-commerce e and m-commerce, and how the United States and its companies, the Fortune 250, can really be part of this wave in um, this new economy, the electronic economy in China, and also a part of Asia Pacific like countries in Indonesia, Vietnam, India, and others that are coming up economically. So, uh, Russell, are you, do you want to continue what you were just saying about how um, you see American companies behind the curve, that they're not uh, seeing what's really exciting in Asia, and they should be part of this uh, big boom in e-commerce, m-commerce? Yes, it'd be great. Thank you very much. Um, we're seeing uh, American companies starting to make their entry to the e-commerce channels here in China, working with the giant e-commerce uh, platforms such as Alibaba. Um, for example, um, Tmall Global, which is a Chinese e-commerce platform, has recently um, linked up with major retail executives, the U.S.-based Costco. So it's interesting because we have Costco warehouses uh, type of setups in the U.S. We're probably going to bypass it here in China. We're going to have this virtual reality uh, e-commerce sales that you just go online and particularly with your smartphone. So that's convenient. You don't have to be at home sitting behind a desk uh, going to the computer and uh, selecting items. You could be on your smartphone. And I think this is another reason why um, e-commerce differs in China because the um, technology Technology here, uh, with the use of smartphones, or and the, the tie-ins with the e-commerce, uh, e-pay platforms, are making this a 24 shopping reality. Uh, whereas in the U.S., uh, we have to go, for example, Amazon.com. Maybe we can use our smartphone, but we typically would go on a computer, look at it, think about it. Uh, the Chinese um, are looking, you know, real time, 24 hours on their smartphone. They don't have to be at home. They can be anywhere. Uh, if they want something, they'll order. I'll give an example. Um, uh, my friend, uh, um, a colleague of mine, what likes to eat seafood. So what she does is she goes on her smartphone, she orders seafood, and it comes from Tianjin, which is a city to the north. Right, right. And lo and behold, she orders, orders in the morning. It's at her doorstep at 6 o'clock uh, in the evening. And it's packed with uh, cooled ice, uh, <laughs> and it's fresh. And again, um, the reason why it's taken off in China is not only the technology, but also the logistics. Um, they've got it wired down. They developed the high-speed trains. For example, a city between Tianjin and Beijing, simply the trains run every few minutes. Uh, the train takes, the high-speed train takes a half-hour ride, that quick, and it comes into Beijing. Uh, and um, it's, it's interesting that the logistics are very important. So again, um, that's the difference in the U.S. I think uh, we lost Russell just for a second, but to really add to what Russell was saying, logistics uh, in e-commerce, m-commerce is the key to for customer service and customer satisfaction because unless you have a logistics system that brings the product to your door in a very efficient and timely manner, w the consumer just won't be satisfied with uh, the expectations of a seamless uh, ordering and um, receiving uh, process in the uh, delivery. So in Japan, Saga Cubing, uh, Kuroneko, Yamato were companies that were like the 
platinum standard in uh, delivery uh, of products to your door. In fact, when I was living in Japan, there were trucks especially designed to be um, just uh, holding very fresh vegetables from the north, from uh, Hokkaido or northern uh, Aomori and so forth, or uh, seafood that would come in from uh, the Sea of Japan or from Kyushu coming into Tokyo through a very um, monitored, uh, environmentally friendly uh, processes. So and so we are uh, trying to get Russell back online right now. Uh, and uh, so the delivery system is a part of that whole e-commerce ecosystem uh, that really is uh, vital to uh, e-commerce. The other uh, part that I uh, want to say is that Alibaba, that uh, Russell mentioned, is uh, a firm that has become a global standard in e-commerce. And its uh, founder is a very ex interesting character named uh, Jack Ma, who, uh, who in a book published by a friend of mine, uh, Duncan Clark, um, earlier uh, this year, really emphasized how he uh, was, uh, struggled through life to um, be, be the uh, king of e-commerce. And that's what his dream and his objective was, to really um, get uh, an ecosystem uh, of uh, e-commerce in China. Jack Ma started out and, uh, as he said, failed at university, failed at a job, failed at many, many things, and yet he had this dream, and now he's at the top of a uh, multi, a huge, empire, billion dollar empire in China that is the standard for e-commerce in the world right now, and it dominates e-commerce in, in the People's Republic of China. Similarly, there's a man named Hiroshi Mirikitani in uh, Japan who heads Rakuten, and he's a Harvard MBA graduate. Uh, and he's really focused on uh, uh, not only in developing commerce and commerce in Japan, but uh, also bringing Rakuten overseas to some other Asian countries in Southeast Asia and other uh, uh, regions. So he is also working on to really expand the experience of e-commerce and commerce uh, globally. Uh, finally, we have. Um, we're still working on Russell to come back to us. Uh, I did a, a survey a few years ago on um, the best-selling Japanese products in China uh, through uh, e-commerce. It was an interesting exercise because uh, a lot of the products, uh, some of them were quite cheap, others were uh, kind of expensive uh, to uh, uh, products, Chinese products on the market. Uh, one of the most interesting uh, products was powdered milk, and of course there was a, um, a huge scandal in uh, powdered baby milk at that time. They had an uh, industrial chemical called melanin, and that opened up a whole uh, world of Chinese families, parents uh, ordering uh, powdered milk from Japan uh, through e-commerce. Another one was diapers, of course, and they saw diapers as having less uh, allergic kind of chemicals on them. Uh, another one was, uh, of all things, a tobacco filter that sold for 4 yen, uh, very cheap, like oh, almost 40 cents. Uh, and and um, it was a, a, a filter they thought would cut down on the chemicals, of course. Uh, who knows wh what happened uh, when they smoke? <laughs> they should stop smoking. But uh, it's a huge market because there are 600 million uh, smokers in the People's Republic of China. So that is a market by itself. Uh, there was another one, Herbal Shampoo was another uh, big seller, and a anti-insect repellent patch. Again, uh, Chinese consumers uh, were really um, uh, thinking about uh, sprays and they didn't like the chemicals and so forth. So you can see that consumers are worried about environmental or chemical uh, kinds of uh, uh, effects on, on their children or, uh, you know, powdered milk that would be uh, you know, pure in, uh, in, in the manufacturing process. So that's the kind of uh, quality issues uh, Chinese consumers deal with, and so they order uh, Japanese goods online. So it's not like uh, the, it's all Chinese goods. There is a large uh, export market into China uh, in, uh, driven by Chinese consumers. 
and the Chinese consumer market, of course, uh, in a country of 1.3 billion people is enormous, enormous. And when you see the evolution of payments and logistics, you can see the future of uh, e-commerce and m-commerce in, in China driven by the numbers, and numbers uh, is what uh, China is all about. And that's where uh, Japan, although Japan percentage-wise is much more of a wealthier country, a middle-class country, but with 129 million people, so it's a much smaller demographic, yet about 80 percent of the people in Japan uh, deal with e-commerce through their phones and laptops. So it's a larger percentage of online purchasing and um, involvement in this uh, e-commerce uh, uh, world. I talked about uh, fashion, where, and that's an area where I think there's a lot more development. All right, and so um, unfortunately uh, we lost Russell. Uh, the the difficulties of the internet is well known, uh, and we we'll, we'll work on it to bring him back in our next show uh, continuously. But you saw how Russell was really at the trenches and really trying to show that China for U.S. firms in the internet space, they really should uh, focus and also bring products uh, that would appeal to Chinese consumers. And like I say, it's not like the Chinese want only Chinese uh, products. They are a, a, a force to reckon with because they take their time to try out things and really uh, look for quality, look for uh, in, uh, environmental friendly products. They really are uh, really uh, consumers that are, are, are focused on getting the best um, and, and uh, products out there in, in the globe. So I will end here as uh, we come to uh, really a really exciting discussion on e-commerce in Asia Pacific. And this is uh, Ray Tsuchiyama of Think Tech Asia. Until next time, we'll bring Russell Liu back from Beijing. Thank you very much.